industry on parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Coming down the assembly line at the Indianapolis plant of the Allison Division of General Motors, a steady stream of the powerful jet engines that help give our Air Force preeminence in the skies. But one of these engines is something special. It's the 10,000th jet engine produced by Allison. And that's occasion enough for a plant party. The workers hear from an Air Force officer just how vital the product of their labors really is. Most of the men and women who contribute to the manufacture of this complicated mechanism never get a close look at the engine in operation. So the celebration explains a lot of things about their own work. Sharing the stage with engine number 10,000 is a brand new product of the factory, an advanced turbojet, the J25A23, just started in production. After number 10,000 has been formally presented to the Air Force, the Allison workers rightly get the first public look at the new aircraft power plant that will occupy their working hours in the months ahead. The Superjet, industry's newest contribution to the defense program. It took a lot of teamwork to build America into the greatest nation in the world. By constantly working together, we have been able to enjoy the highest standard of living known to man. While we're strengthening our national defense to halt the further spread of communism, all of us, consumers, employees, employers, and farmers, must display the same teamwork that made us great. In the struggle against our enemy, we must guard against those who would destroy us from within. Only by working together during this national emergency can we expect to build a strong America and maintain freedom as we know it. Fifty First Street, just off Fifth Avenue on the island of Manhattan, center of one of the most glamorous industries in the big town. It's headquarters of the diamond firm of Harry Winston, where we find a designer putting on paper the wishes of a customer. But to start at the beginning with the diamond in the rough, the first job is to study the grain of the stone to determine how it can be divided so as to eliminate flaws and still save the greatest possible amount of the precious material. After marking it with India ink, he passes it on to another expert who will cleave it. The marked diamond is set in a holder fixed in place by shellac. Now it must be notched for the knife that will cleave it. And unless that notch is perfect, the blow of the hammer will shatter it to bits instead of dividing it neatly in two. A good cut. In many cases, the cleaving is done by saws, but in all cases, the diamond finally arrives at the polishing stage where it gets its facets. These are the plane surfaces of the stone, usually 58 of them, put on by a wheel coated with a mixture of olive oil and diamond dust. But now let's see how the lady's necklace is progressing. A carefully drawn rendition of the designer's rough sketch is brought to the men who must work the platinum or other precious metal that will hold the jewels together. The smaller diamonds in the piece are set in place. Following the designer's drawing every step of the way, the necklace slowly takes shape over a period of days or even weeks. The setting is now embedded in shellac as the metalsmiths prepare to add additional settings for the individual diamonds that will be suspended from it. 
Most of the work here at Winston's involves the production of much less expensive jewelry, the diamond engagement rings, for example, that have become a standard American custom. But intricate pieces like this allow these expert craftsmen to use their unique skills to the fullest. Meanwhile, the specially cut diamonds that will hang from Milady's necklace have been assembled in wax, and now it's time to set them in place. There you have a piece of jewelry that's really a work of art, one that will endure and retain its brilliant beauty for many generations. A final cleaning and polishing, and it's ready for the critical inspection of the woman who described her ideas many days before. Hard to believe that chemically diamonds are identical with coal, but the perfect crystallization brought about by nature in a way that still isn't fully understood transforms the humble element called carbon into a thing of rare beauty. Nature and the age-old skills of the men of the diamond industry. Into the lifeboats of a U.S. Navy fighting ship go a vital emergency ration. What's in the cans these sailors are stowing away? Water. Pure, clean water. Up to World War II, lifeboat and life raft water supplies were kept in wooden kegs. Often, shipwrecked sailors found their precious water supply had gone bad. That's when the multiple breaker company of Boston started putting water in cans. Pure water that goes in while boiling violently. Immediately, before there's any chance of the contents becoming desterilized, the lids are put on and the cans are hermetically sealed. But even though the water was still practically boiling when the tops went on, no chances are taken. The water was exposed to the air for a few seconds. So now the sealed cans are placed in a pressure cooker where live steam plays about them for a few minutes at a time. And still they're not ready for shipment. The outside of the cans must be waxed to protect them from the elements. This is one company that's grateful that less than 1% of its product will ever be used. But it's nonetheless determined that the tiny fraction that is used will be in condition to save lives. In addition to more than a million cans of water now being packed for the Navy, the firm is also busy with orders for the Merchant Marine, for yachtsmen, and for flyers' emergency kits. And a new program is underway providing canned drinking water supplies for civilian consumption in the event of any emergency. So the idea of going to all the trouble of canning plain water proves to be not such a whimsical idea after all. It costs a lot of money to build all the tanks, planes, ships, and ammunition needed for defense. It costs more because inflation has robbed our dollar of nearly half its value in the last dozen years. Inflation created by the government when it failed to pay all the costs as we fought World War II. By paying only 40% of the bill in cash, we're continuing to pay the other 60% through inflation, which cheapens all of our dollars. The sensible way to halt further inflation is for the government to cut every non-defense expenditure and to raise all the money we need by wise taxation. It's up to all of us to help stop inflation now. Five years ago, this was a vast checkerboard of potato farms on New York's Long Island. Today, a community of 60,000 persons living in 15,000 homes, all built by one firm. This is Levittown one of the most remarkable housing developments ever conceived. The idea that came to a man named Bill Levitt was this. 
Why not apply to the building of houses the same principles that have brought other American industries to their unexcelled peaks of efficiency and service? Why not mass produce the elements that go to make up a house just as the auto industry does with the parts that go into a new car? Bill Levitt had some other ideas. Put kitchen and bathroom back to back and let them share the same plumbing. Let your plumbers do their work without interruption and without waiting for the carpenter or the bricklayer to get out of the way. Pre-cut your lumber so it's all ready to be assembled into the frame of a house. With the waste removed, one truck can deliver to the building site all the rough lumber that will go into two complete Levitt homes. It's really a matter of organization and planning, getting rid of waste motion. When the foundation is ready, coils for the radiant heating are there, not a day too soon or a day too late. Without delay, the steam fitters finish their work and move on to the next house, and right behind them come the masons to lay the underflooring. Power-driven trowels make the job a lot easier and faster. Levitt Town houses are not prefabricated. Prefabrication means a factory operation in which large quantities of materials are kept moving to the workers. Here, the opposite is true. The construction crews are moved to a waiting line of materials. This sort of organization and efficiency is all important in the vast defense housing program. That's the next order of business for the nation's home builders. The architecture of the houses in Levittown is varied enough to eliminate dreary monotony, while at the same time enough alike to permit the savings that result from standardization. Many housing projects are a sea of mud when it rains, but not this one. A wide range of color schemes also brings variety. So here's the home that cost its happy owners just $9,000. And that includes such extras as a completely equipped kitchen, a two-way fireplace, a finished room in the attic, and even a washing machine. The living room. Levittown is a community of young people, and that means a great need for schools. Space has been set aside for plenty of them. Dotted here and there throughout the huge area are shopping centers where every type of product or service is readily available. Shoe stores, five and dimes, department stores. Supermarkets and banks. In addition, there are other facilities designed to draw residents together to help make them feel they are part of a real community. Recreation centers with provisions for filling leisure hours, summer or winter. Yes, that old potato patch has come to a good end. <laughs>